Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Shaper Sessions. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about this really cool thing that we got going on. It's the Shaper Box Challenge. It would be cool if we could just pop over and show everybody quickly what our submissions page on Instagram looks like yeah. right now before we dive into the details of that beautiful box you've got on the bench. Yeah, that um, ha hashtag Shaper Box Challenge page. Yeah. Exactly. If you just type in the hashtag into the search bar, this page will pull up. And Goose, could you pop over to my screen here? Yeah, here we go. OK, cool. So again, if you go to Instagram, just search for hashtag ShaperBoxChallenge. Um, this will show you, A, what you're up against if you decide to submit. B, a lot of really cool ideas for box making. Um, both for origin users and for non-origin users. I've browsed through this, and it's about 50-50 whether these boxes were made with origin or not. And I'm just so excited about this. I wanted to give everybody a sneak peek here. We're going to go into Jake's box and talk about that for a little while. He's going to cut a feature of that box. Um, and it's kind of a long one. So we'll do half of that while we're watching and talking about what Jake's doing. And then the other half while he basically repeats what he did for the first round as he does part B of that, which is basically an identical operation. We'll go back in here and talk a little bit more about some boxes, because there's some really cool stuff in here. But speaking of cool stuff, Jake, we've got your box to look at. And there are some incredible details on this. Let's go back to the shop cam. All right. So this is my submission. I wanted to make a kind of a legged box. Um, so instead of doing your typical, your like mitered corners or uh, box joints or anything like that, I went mortise and tenon route um, and just did a recessed lid. But what made it really fun and really difficult, <laughs> really time consuming, I should say, is these legs were all multi sided operations done on workstation. So every face has something on it. So in prepping for this project, the squareness and the dimension of your stock is critical. So all of my stock I have here is milled to exactly an inch and an eighth by an inch and an eighth and 10 inches long. Now, the hardest part about figuring out how to make these things, we're going, you know, bouncing ideas around. Do we use shelf? Um, because they're small and it's still hard maple. I wasn't sure if double-sided tape would do the trick. And Russ came up with the idea of cutting our material long, putting it in workstation, and allowing, actually giving us extra space on the sides to clamp it into workstation when we're only doing our cut work on the inside, but have a little bit of extra stuff on the outside to clamp to. So by the end of it, it ended up like this. Yeah, how yeah. cool is that? Let's look at that on the bench cam. So down here. So like I said, every side has a cut to it and just a little bit of material left over here keeping it together. But it allows me to set up a grid, cut and rotate along the way without having to re-grid at all because my material is nice and uh, square on all edges. I'm confident that by the end of it, everything will line up. Now, um, Jake, could you go back to that yeah. for me, for my sake, and just point out all of the features that you cut and what operations they were? Totally. Because there's so much that goes into this. I'm still wrapping my head around your box. So bringing the actual thing over into it, I wanted to have this like pointed profile so it kind of swoops down, comes out, and then tucks in a little deeper for the foot of the box. So we have that profile cut from the top rotated and cut again. We have a decorative element using a point cutter or bead cutter on two sides, on the outside edges. And then we have the offset mortises. Uh, because this box is so small and I'm trying to pack it all in, I had to offset my tenons, offset my mortises, so that it would all fit together. And it wow. worked, out, worked out quite well. Mm -hmm. And because you've left those pieces on either end of that leg, then you can still clamp it all the way around, regardless of how much you've cut away. Exactly. And then safely take it over to the miter saw and just trim off those edges. Beautiful. Nice and easy operation. The second part about it that was uh, inspired by a project that was recently put up on Shaper Hub, 
the bench brush from Aspen Golon is the side panel itself. So I wanted to match that kind of little kicked out feature on the foot with the side panel and had a lot of fun doing it. So using that same style of a uh, kind of roughing out my profile with a stepped feature in Origin. I have my depths down here just using depth and offset kind of gave myself a rough guideline for what my shape is going to be and for the rest of this I'll just trim off trim it off on the uh, table saw just so I'm not hogging all that material off with with Origin. Um, but just a quick close-up of this we'll go through what that looks like if you can see those steps. So from this point, it's real easy to rough it out with a gouge, something like a number five gouge, get those high points out, and then come back in with a series of cabinet scrapers, especially these curved profile cabinet scrapers. And you can find that internal radius just right, and it's money. Mm -hmm. And to fill anyone in who hasn't been paying attention to our premium projects over the last six months or so, I did just pull up the bench brush here. Goose, could we go to my screen again? So for reference, this is what Jake's talking about here. Um, this is a really cool premium project that we released a little while ago. You can see this beautiful pile of brushes on the title image. And all of these organic shaped contours were created with guides very similar to what Jake just showed you. Um, so as you go through this project, you'll create steps uh, that you'll then mark on the inside of those contours with a pencil and then use uh, traditional hand woodworking tools like rasps and files and spoke shaves to go in and clean all that up to create this beautiful but reliably identical um, organic shape, which takes years to develop an eye for uh, for doing by hand. But if you can get in just a little bit of guide, then it really helps make that process quick and repeatable. And I don't know, we've been cranking out these brushes basically since this project was created. I think we both made a couple for the holidays. Um, I've got one sitting on my bench right now upstairs. and. It's a really fun process to just do those steps. Um, it roughs out a lot of the material for you at the same time on the way, and then go back and finish that with a rasp or a scraper or a gouge in this case. Yeah. All right, a couple of things before I got started on this project. It can get a little confusing, mainly because of these offset mortises. So I highly recommend kind of laying everything out before you get started. I even go as far as to just like standing my legs up and deciding, okay, what do I want where? What grain do I want facing out? And in the project that I believe Ted is going to be linking in the comments, there's a photo of my original sketch and it just has some like A1, A2 markings. And that just kind of gives you an idea of what's going to land where. So that when you have your side panels all cut and the tendons cut, everything's going to come together. But go into it slowly uh, whenever you can. Mark with a pencil exactly what you're doing. I will actually go as far as to actually just draw where my mortises are going to be. Because when you're in the thick of it, you're, you're cruising, you're in workstation, you're just going. Things can get lost quickly when you're in the flow. So do yourself a favor. Draw directly on your material. You can always sand it off later. All right. So I'm going to take one of these pieces and head to my workstation. So I have my clamping face up at the highest level because I'm not actually cutting into that back side. I don't need my spoil board. And I also have my angle guide set up right here. This is not only good for holding angles, but also if you just keep it in the 90 degree setting, it gives you an extension of your reference pin face. And it brings it up higher, which in this case is exactly what I need. I've also given myself a little mark X, so that is the edge that I'm referencing the whole time. So as I rotate and do my cuts, I'm keeping that same reference edge. Coming in with my support bar. 
There's a lot of clamping and unclamping here. It would be really terrible if you got which if you forgot which side was which. Exactly. And I'm just kind of cambering these clamps out slightly because I want to make sure they don't come above the surface too. I don't want origin to bump into them. So I Could cut be these good if you if you hadn't done four legs already, this might even be like your seventh or eighth leg that you've cut because I know we've done a lot for oh, practice. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. But if you hadn't done this so many times, speaking of marking, it could be a good idea to just take a ruler and mark your safe area for clamping on your leg yeah. so that you don't clamp over an unsafe area accidentally. In this case, the foot itself or the leg itself is six inches. So I have about an inch and a half on either end of safe zone. You don't want to accidentally cut into your clamps. It's not, it's not a fun surprise. You've got, me, about, uh, you've got about a 16th inch of rubber before you get to the real meat yeah. in there. If it starts not to sound much different, warning. You know, <laughs> that's yeah. your sign. But it's OK. We've all done it. All right. There we go. We've got our nice flat reference. Sneak this up, not too close, but just enough to support the back end of origin. And we're ready to rock. I'm going to create that grid. But just to be on the safe side, in case there's any variability in my thicknesses, I'm going to make a grid off of the back side of my material, that face that is actually clamped against the workstation. So I'll do a grid off here, here, and here. As a reminder, that's the most constrained type of grid because this point and this face is not going to change. However, this edge might change by a couple thou here and there. So just moving forward with projects, whether it be your standard mortise and tenon for a chair or something, just think about that. If you're repeating that process over and over, how can you limit the variables um, in milling or thickness or material, whatever it may be? So just a thought. All right, all starts with a scan. I scan my workstation just like I scan any other thing. Nice and steady, side to side, overlapping those passes, making sure I have a nice clean image and multiple images of every row of tape. That's a good looking scan. Thank y'all. I love seeing all the blue dominoes. That's how you know you really got them all. Oh yeah. And then you look over and there's a speck of dust on one domino and you blow it off and it, become, it turns blue again for you. Perfect. Um, all right. I have my engraving bit in there backwards, so I'm going to use that as my probe. So we got a new grid. I'm actually lowering down into that little T-track channel, which you can see here. And of course, I need to change the edge that I'm using as a probe. And I can always just jump through my options here, but I want to make use that edge closest to myself. Make contact. Bingo. Bongo. And my last one. There. And in case it isn't clear to everyone, you're picking up there to move around and past the yeah. two slots. T uh, physically lifting up. Yeah. You can also adjust the height, but in this case it's unnecessary. You just tilt towards or forward, scoot over and lower it back down. Mm -hmm. All right. So my material for the legs is an, eighth, uh, an inch and an eighth thick, which, if I want to do a finish pass, is a little on the thick side for our standard cutter that comes with origin. But I'm going to bust out an eight millimeter collet which you can find on our store for all your eight millimeter bit needs. And I'm also gonna grab something that I am very pleased with. It is, uh, where should we go down here? Yeah, let's go, uh, let's go to the origin cam. This is a eight millimeter, well actually it's 7.9 millimeter, three flute bit with a 36 millimeter cut cut flute length that you will that's long that's long that you will soon be able to buy on our store so keep your eye out 
for when we release it, but we're very excited to release a, an array of, a, a new array of bits that you can buy on our store. So when, when we're saying, hey, you need something with a really long cutter flute, or you need something with a, a large diameter head, we know exactly where to point you now. We got the thing for you. We got the thing you for you. You may not know that our buddy Goose, who operates the switchboard, is also uh, an esteemed graphic designer. And he just informed us this afternoon that he ordered all of the labels today. So it's real. It's They're real. coming. All right. So I got this, got this monster chucked up nicely. It's also great when you, when you chuck it up in the collet exactly where it tells you to. And you slide it in. It hovers just about like two millimeters above your surface, so it's like the perfect, perfect length. It really tells you you're getting beautiful. You're getting the maximum. You can actually cut a little bit deeper with this bit, um, but the flute length itself is 36 millimeters, which I like doing my finish cuts, engaging the full flutes. So that's what I look at. And 36 millimeters for everyone watching from the states is about an inch and a half, just a, a little bit under an yeah. inch and a half. Yeah. So for this inch and an eighth leg, it's going to be more than enough. Cool. So into my bit settings, I'm doing 7.9 millimeters. Real short Z touch. And we can bring in our file. Let's start it off with leg mortise A. And I want to make sure I grab that top left anchor point. I'm just dropping it at zero, zero. So Jimmy just pulled that file from ShaperHub, import, and you too can have these files and uh, make your own box just like this one. We uploaded this project to ShaperHub this afternoon. So it's ready to go for anyone else who wants to make a box in this style. Yeah. So this, this space over here, again, that's just my waist space. That's where I'm clamping. And I've made a guide that is 10 inches long just to account to make snapping to this material nice and easy. And an important note, I'm not actually cutting all the way through this. I'm going to start and end my cut about here and here just enough to where I come around that corner and it gives me something to register the miter saw blade against when I'm done. All right, I'm going to do this in a couple of passes, a couple of rough passes, followed by a finish pass. Do everything with a 0.02 offset, give myself a little wiggle room. And here we go. Awesome. So while Jake's cutting, I can narrate a little bit and explain for anyone who's new to Shaper Sessions or Shaper Origin. Um, what Jake's doing here is what's called an outside cut. We've got a couple of different cut types uh, in an outside cut. What he's doing is cutting the outside of a pre-programmed profile. And there are a couple settings that you want to adjust as you do that. One is the depth. So we're going to cut this particular profile in three roughing passes and one finishing pass. So three different depths and two offsets. Uh, right now Jake's working with a 0.2 millimeter offset it sounded like. Uh, that leaves a little bit extra material outside that outside profile. And then once he's all the way down to full depth he's going to come back in with a zero offset and just clean that up right exactly to the edge of that profile that he's shooting for. Um, and we can do all of this at full depth because this cutter has cutting flutes that are long enough to cut that whole face at once. With a shorter cutter, you can't always get exactly the depth that you want. So that's why we're bringing these longer cutters to you soon. Um, and you can see also the coolest thing I think about Origin, which is that as Jake's cutting, you can see the dot floating around the crosshairs. And what the dot represents is the center of the actual spindle, where it is in space. And the crosshairs represents, and the circle around it, your corrective cutting area. 
So Shaper Origin is a handheld CNC machine and the way that it works is you move this machine around in physical space, but as a human, your movements obviously aren't ever going to be exactly perfect. So what it does is corrects for you in real time to put those cuts exactly where they need to be. And you can see this if you can see the spindle moving around a little bit, shifting in the X and Y plane as Jake cuts. It's a little bit more obvious on the shallower depth cuts than on the deep cuts, uh, but you can see that spindle moving in the XY plane, compensating for any error that Jake introduces to the system. And the key with all of this is just to keep it smooth. It doesn't really matter where exactly that dot is within the circle. The smoother you are moving the machine, the smoother your results are going to be. And we'll see Jake's results with this finishing pass as soon as he's done with it. You can see that he just changed that offset to zero. He's still at that full depth and he's coming all the way around. If Jake were to leave the corrective range, Origin would automatically retract and that would save his workpiece. So let's see how she looks. How'd you do, Jake? I absolutely love this bit. <laughs> it's nice. So sharp and so wonderful to use. You can see I was doing uh, some aggressive rough cuts and then that finish pass because of those three flutes and they're just really sharp. That finish is glassy. Mm -hmm. There's something about this cutter. It's gnarly sharp. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so that one, that first one's done. You saw I had a little bit of material hanging off, and before I did my finish pass, I just kind of peeled that off and got it out of the way so it's not flapping mm -hmm. around. And since I have my A side up, I can see my mortises already here, so I'm going to swap to my eighth inch cutter and cut my mortises while I have it here. Perfect. Um, while you're swapping the cutter, I'll talk a little bit about the swapping process. There are a couple different uh, mindsets that you can take as you do a project start to finish. Um, the one that I think Jake and I both would default to for this project is flip the part rather than change cutters a lot. Changing cutters a lot can take up time because obviously there's a lot of clamping and unclamping of the collet to do and then you have to z-touch every time and you have to change your depths etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas if you just reclamp your part in a new orientation that can be a lot faster. But for the purposes of this show we're gonna do cut A, B, C, the profile, the mortises, and then the bead and then we're gonna do profile A, B, C again. So this is a little bit more cutter changing than we would normally do, but I wanted to have a nice big block of time to just talk about boxes <laughs> while Jake's cutting. We don't need to show you the same thing over and over again. Um, so while he's doing round two of all these, we'll go back over to Instagram and look at some really awesome box inspiration, get some ideas for everyone's next projects. See, you can see we just Z-touched again uh, you're setting your depths and your offsets, is that right, Jake? Exactly. I'm going to go in with a 0.02 offset again and creep up on my fit because, again, I have my tendons already cut at a 0.0, mm -hmm. .0 offset. So that is true to size. And I do all my fine editing over here on the mortise. But I have a feeling it's going to be about four thousandths, negative four thou. Mm -hmm. So I'll just You've done a that. lot of these. I've done a couple of these so far. <laughs> Guessing you've got pretty good intuition for that one at yeah. this point. All right, and the go. variables there can be uh, anything, basically. Uh, there's cutter diameter, there are the material properties of the wood specifically, whether the wood springs back a little bit or whether it really stays in one place. Um, a material like plywood tends to have different offsets required for a mortise and tenon fit than a hardwood like maple or a softwood like balsa. Um, balsa would have different offsets as well. And then you've got different offsets for corian or solid surface materials. And it really comes down to checking the fit of a pair of mortise and tenons, uh, fine tuning that offset once. And once you've fine tuned that offset for your materials and your cutter and your cut settings, your depths, all of those things, then you can take that as a more or less repeatable offset. So 
doing these two mortises right now will find out exactly what offset Jake needs. And then if he were to go ahead and continue to do the rest of this box, it's a pretty safe assumption to keep those offsets uh, identical for all of the rest of the legs. You always want to check, but pretty safe assumption there. And how's that, how's that fit? That feels good to me. I made it just a hair deeper. So my tenon is um, 3 eighths or 0.375. And I made these 0.385. Just a little bit of room. I don't want my tenons to, to bottom out before I get a good seal. And just testing that fit. Snug. That is what I want to see. Is that the fabled squeaky fit? That is a squeaky fit. Perfect. That is exactly what I want to see. All right. I love a squeaky fit. It's a multi-sensory experience, a oh, good yeah. fit. You can hear it. Um, and then the other telltale is being able to assemble the fit, but it also stays in place when yeah. your hand's off. Right. You, sh you should see here, Fine line. here at Shaper, anytime someone gets a, a really satisfying fit, uh, they run around the office and be like, shh, listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Or uh, the the inverse of that, the the pop yeah. as you pull it apart. Yeah. That's a good one too. Um, speaking of which, I've seen I've seen some boxes in this box challenge that had a real beautiful like vacuum suction, kind of like when you open an Apple product or you uh, it has that suction Ooh. of the yeah. lid. I've seen a couple of boxes out there that have that same that same level of precision fit, which makes me very happy to see. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. All right, I'm gonna pop this out, rotate. So rotate up on edge. Always put this back into place. Firm mm -hmm. up against my bar and up against my support bar. For quick and dirty stuff, sometimes I ignore the support bar, but if you really want to get that height spot on, it's very important. Oh yeah, I like it. I like knowing that everything's totally smooth and I'm not gonna feel any snags as I roll over it. Mm -hmm. so, be cautious too, because sometimes as you crank on clamps, they will move, you know, any type of clamp will do this, and they'll pull your piece in the direction so you just want to be cautious of that. Make sure their clamp is seated well before you go ham on it. There we go. Beautiful. And these are just the standard clamps that we include with Workstation yeah. as well. Yeah, um, they're perfect for this application because they mm -hmm. allow me to kind of tuck them out of the way. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time I like to use the F-style clamps, but those probably wouldn't be appropriate for this. You'd have that big handle in the way your support bar. Exactly. I wouldn't be able to slide this up uh, and use it as well. Mm -hmm. So this is a little byproduct left over from the process. It doesn't quite cut through. And for our next process, I'm going to need a little bit more sp space here. So I recommend just taking a knife and shaving that away just so that it doesn't get in the way of our next cutter. The chisel works too, but I'm being crude. I like the knife, man. It's always sharp. Yeah. We spend a lot of time keeping the chisel sharp here, and it's still not as much time as we should be spending keeping the chisel sharp. Yeah. So having a knife that you can just snap off and have a perfectly sharp, fresh blade is really, really nice for the things that it works for. It is indeed. Wouldn't want to cut a tenon with an Olfa knife, but not unless you it was could like if you're a patient wood. man. Yeah. All right. I like to say A B S. Always be snapping. Always be snapping that blade. I don't. I don't think I snap mine enough. Always be snapping, Jake. They're like ten cents or something like that. Yeah, but you never Fresh know. Fresh blade all the time. All right. So I'm using an, uh, another cutter. It is a point cutter or a point cutting bit or also known as a bead cutter, depends on where you're looking. Um, but it is a, we'll come down over here on origin cam. There it is. It is a radi uh, eighth inch radius and allows you to do internal radiuses. Really handy for detail stuff. Um, 
I'm going to use it for my beading. Just it's very important that this doesn't have a bearing. You might yes. be used to seeing a cutter similar to this with a bearing. Very important that there's no bearing for Origin. Exactly. Origin will follow the contour anyway. That's uh, how it works. It's programmed to do that. Uh, that's what the bearing would do in the case that you would want one on a router table or on a hand router. Um, but please, no bearings with Origin. That's what makes this cutter so great. All right, and I'm actually touching off directly. I want to make sure I get a good Z touch. I'm touching off on that, that lower part actually right here. If you can hop over this camera. So this part that I freshly cut that is actually it's lower than my my workstation surface, touched off on that because I know I want to go exactly an eighth of an inch deep from this surface to get that proper radius to kind of come over and terminate where I want it to. And I trim this so I actually have room to enter and exit that cut. Okay. How many passes are you going to do on this one, Jake? I'm going to do it in two passes, but once I get rid of this business, so mm, I see. Remove that and bring in bead cut A. Wherever bead cut A is. There it is, bead cut A. There's A and B based on the orientation. Same deal, using that top left anchor point. I should have put custom anchor points in here. And I decided to go with an online cut for this because, again, it's I don't need to worry about offsets. I'm just following that path of this with this point cutting bit. Um, but to give myself a little bit of wiggle room because I don't have offsets, I'm going to do it in two depth passes. I point one one to take out the majority of the material, and then I point one two five to just do that finish pass. Beautiful. All right, here we go. And you just saw also one of the reasons why I would recommend if you're doing this project, cut all of the side A's first, um, cut all of the profiles first, then cut all of the mortises, then cut all of these beads. And that's because uh, switching the file is another opportunity to just make a mistake. Uh, like you want to mark all of the different sides of your workpiece, you want to take as much care as you can to use the right files at the right time and not switching files a lot will will help you use the right file at the right time. This is an online cut so you'll see when Jake gets back to cutting oh, got a little maybe clamp readjustment there. See when Jake gets back to cutting that Origin is following simply the line that he programmed um, and that goes back to the types of cut you can do here. We do outside cuts, inside cuts, online cuts, pocketing cuts, which are very cool. They're adaptive cuts that allow you to clear a large area at once. And then we also support guidelines. So if, for example, you wanted to write some text or leave a note in your file for yourself to help you keep track of what you're doing, you could use a guideline for that. There we go. So there is that detail right here. Since we haven't cut this internal curve yet, we're not seeing exactly, but it will be nicely centered just like this one. Beautiful. All right, so cool. that's half of this guy. Yeah, and uh, you're going to keep cranking on that while I show the people some cool boxes, yeah? Exactly. OK, I love it. Um, we'll check in every once in a while to see how you're doing. Sounds good. I'll see you in a bit. All right, have fun. All right, so uh, yeah, I'm just going to show everybody uh, some of my favorite boxes from hashtag ShaperBoxChallenge here on Instagram because we've got a couple of really awesome ones, some boxes that you can use as inspiration uh, for your next project or for this project. But before we dive into that, another reminder, please uh, let's hear any comments that you have to add to the conversation. Ted is in the comments answering questions, quick ones longer questions we, Jake and I both, will answer at Q&A at the end of the show. 
Uh, for anyone joining us live, we're going to carry on after Jake's done with his box and after we're done chatting about hashtag Shaper Box Challenge for a live Q&A about anything that you want to ask related to boxes or Shaper Origin, even more broadly, generally. And then we're also going to do some giveaways. So there's going to be a poll that pops up at the bottom of your screen. Answer the question in that poll, fill out a little bit of information, and you're going to be entered to win our giveaway today of an eighth inch collet, double-sided tape, and a t-shirt. I think those are the three things. Um, yeah, so please, comment away. Love to hear everybody's thoughts. We also read the comments at the end of the show, so if there are any requests that you have that aren't comments or that aren't questions, yeah, get them in there. Love to hear from everyone. So let's pop over to the screen again and look at hashtag shape or box challenge here on Instagram. And I've pulled out a couple of the boxes that I think are really just phenomenal. And I'm going to go through them uh, more or less one by one. We'll see what pops up. They each have a different, very cool thing about them. This is a box from Oni He. And so here's the thing about a box. You would think that a box is a rectilinear thing. Uh, it's square, straight sides, straight edges. What I love about this box is that the handle is turned, and not only is it turned, but it's turned as a bird. Put a bird on it. I love that. Uh, we've also got some really, really ornate dovetails in this box, and it's unclear to me whether this box was made with Origin or not. This is a great candidate for being made with Origin. Um, you would have a hard time designing these dovetails on tool. We have some on tool CAD that can do some basic shapes and can do box joints naturally and natively on the tool itself without ever having to look at a computer. But if you were to design these dovetails in a digital design software such as Adobe Illustrator or Autodesk Fusion 360, this is totally an origin project. At least these end grain dovetails. You'd probably have kind of a hard time cutting out these side grain dovetails, but I'm sure there's a way to figure it out. And this is a classic just nested lidded box, more like Jake's. We'll see some hardware boxes with hinged lids coming up soon, and I'd love to talk about that. Got a quick little video here just showing off some of the details. Um, love seeing this box. Would love to see a little bit more process if you have yet to submit your personal shaper box challenge submission. Uh, we're judging, not we as in Jake and I, but we, the judges, our panel of four judges, including uh, Laura Mays, Barbara Ostel, who's the chairwoman of TTS. Uh, she's a train joiner, but also now runs companies such as Festool and has a big hand in shaping shaper tools direction as well. Uh, she's a judge, Hubert Newman, uh, editor of DDS Magazine, famed trade joinery magazine in Germany, is a judge, and then Matt Kenny, author of 52 Boxes in 52 Weeks and former fine woodworking editor. Just to hype up our judges for a moment. Um, anyway, they're going to be judging, and they're going to be judging based on design, craftsmanship, and last but not least, process. So make sure you document your process. Let's show off another box. This is a stretch of the definition box, but I love it. I'm going to allow it. It has a lid, which was our only requirement. This is a box with a strap slash satchel slash purse. And I love the creativity here. We've got a wooden tambour covering. I've seen a couple of tambour boxes in this competition, uh, and I love to see it. We did a shaper session on tambour about six months ago that you can always go back and watch on Shaper Sessions On Demand, which is shapertools.com slash sessions or sessions.shapertools.com. Either will get you there. We've got a whole list of all of our previous sessions that you can watch on demand. Check out the one on Tambor. And this is also very cool because of the incorporation of felt and leather. I love a good multi-material project.
Goose is saying mute the video. Goose, can I continue playing the video on quiet? Like it's muted. Yeah, 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 no sound. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> that was a loud one, I guess. Um, okay, so anyway, I'll just narrate. We've got this veneer wrapped around a form, wrapped around a mandrel. Um, clever sawing and finishing solutions to get this separated. Nice finishing solution with the mandrel there and the sandpaper. And this is about a two minute long video and it just gets better as it goes. We're gonna separate this ring and now you might be able to see where this is going. This outer ring that slides over the inner ring is going to be the lid of the box. The lid's not a top or bottom. The lid is all the way around. I just love this. So he's gluing this up and then we're about to come to some really neat finishing techniques to just contour this whole thing. And this is kind of in line with what Jake was showing us with his, uh, with his shaped panel. I love any opportunity that you can get to add a little bit of organic nature to a box or a little bit of hand shaping to a box. Just sanding open an opening here. Kind of like we were just talking about with the Ulfa knife. Always be snapping. Nothing like a good sharp Ulfa knife. Same thing on the ring lid. And now get ready for the big reveal. Uh, bam. This is it. I wish y'all could see the smile on my face. I love how creative this box is. The process, speaking of process, the process documentation on this one is killer. And man, what awesome craftsmanship and creative design. I think this one's in the running. Pop over to a lathe box. This is a pretty classic one turned on a lathe. Uh, pocketed out, perhaps with origin. That could be pocketed. Could see these uh, like semicircular pockets here. Got a nice little leather pull on the top. Now this one's neat. I love this box because it incorporates something that's very near to my heart, and that is hardware. You can see these side rail hinges here. And uh, for anyone who's new to Shaper Sessions, you may not know we did a Shaper Session on hardware install just a couple months ago. Uh, Noah and I did that one, and that's really meaningful to me because Noah and I spent a lot of time over the last year building out Shaper's hardware library, along with a bunch of our other fellow colleagues. I don't want to leave anybody out, but Noah and I did the session on it. So check us out. Um, Shaper session on hardware. We'll walk you through all of like the ins and outs of how to install hardware with Origin, from the most difficult part for most people, which is creating the files all the way to getting those on your machine and cutting them out in a project. And what's cool about this hardware library is that it basically cuts out that hardest part of the whole thing, which is how do you create a reliable hardware file or find one that someone else has made and trust it? Well, I'm pleased to give you months of hard work, which is the all of the different hardware objects that you can need to make a box. We've got probably 30 different hardware options from Brusso that you can choose from. We've also got some box making hardware from Lamello, uh, the Cabanillo, which is great for larger boxes or cabinetry. We've got some door hinges from Sauce and Simonswerk. Um, the Sauce hinges also work for smaller boxes as well. Uh, anything that you need really to make a box is going to be in there. A couple of snap for boxes from Brusso as well. Check out that Shaper Hub hardware library uh, and the session to go along with it. Let's go back to looking at these. So you can see this side rail hinge is installed in the side rail of the box and that's a perfect opportunity to mount that box up in workstation and just carve out the mortise for that hinge perfectly all the way up to a nice clean line with that whole profile all the way around. I also love this outer panel and how it's shaped. 
And then this is not a submission. This is just Laura flexing. So Laura Mays is one of our judges, as I mentioned earlier. Um, she's a, she is the director of the Krenov School of Woodworking up in Fort Bragg, California, and a uh, incredible woodworker herself. And these are some boxes that she made that you can find, again, under hashtag ShaperBoxChallenge. Sorry, Laura, you're not going to be able to win. But we've got these very cool geometric shaped boxes, all with, I think, hand cut dovetails, knowing her. This shaped box, which really reminds me of the shaped panels on Jake's box. Some more really cool shaped geometric boxes. I love all of these. I love that huge dovetail right there. And it looks like they actually wrap all the way around. So it's 360 degree dovetails. And then this box, which must have been burned somehow, charred artfully. I'm not up to snuff on my finishing terms, especially in the Japanese style, which I think a lot of this comes from. But this looks like a really beautiful charred oak or ash. So to hype up our judges, Laura's really incredible. They're all really incredible. These just happen to be the ones that popped up on Instagram, presented themselves to me. But how inspiring is that? Let's see what else we got. I can still hear Jake cutting. I remember this one being a good example of marquetry. We've got a lot of really cool, here we go, really cool marquetry all on the entire outside of the box. And then what I thought was exceptionally neat about this one is that all of the hardware is handmade. You can see that this lid stay is wood and that the hinge is wood as well. Looks like a jewelry box with some nice inset dividers here. But I really love what jumped out to me about this was all of these handmade details, the hinge and the lid stay specifically. Uh, if you want to learn more about marquetry, feels like we've got a shaper session for everything. But check out the last shaper session we did with Ramon Valdez about marquetry. I think that was one or two sessions ago. Um, and man, that guy is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, we had a two and a half hour session, including at least an hour of Q&A. So for anyone watching this on demand, uh, that's really what you're missing out on when you don't join us live on Thursdays for Shaper Sessions is this Q&A where you can ask anything that you want. And we learned so much about marquetry that day from the questions that you all were asking. So I love that. And uh, let's go back to the screen for one more. I thought this was really cool custom keyboard box. So the story behind your box is not explicitly a judging criteria, but if you can tell a cool story, then that just puts it over to the top to me. And making a box so unique for a specific object um, says something about the amount of care that people have for their things and for the people that care about those things. Uh, which is kind of circular if it's a thing that you own and you're making a box for yourself. But if you make a, a ring box, that just puts the ring and its presentation over the top for someone else, little things like that. So I love the story of this keyboard box and uh, how this person loves their keyboard so much that they dedicated probably a week's worth of work to just making a travel box for it. I love that. Jake, how are you doing over there? All done. All right. <laughs> Cool. Kind of perfect timing. Nice. I love that. I can stop rambling about boxes then. How'd it go? It went well. So I definitely think the, the fastest way to, go, way to go about doing these legs is to put your bid in, whether it be your 8 millimeter or whatever, do those processes, switch bits, and so instead of switching bits for every, every side. But it doesn't matter either way. This. You'll get there in the end. Exactly. We have. Whoops. There wow. we go. Wow. Wow. Can't so believe it. Now I, I can have, believe it. I have but it's incredible. Two of my legs. I don't know. Uh, bench cam. Yeah, let's try the bench cam. And just a sanity check. Again, the hardest part is just making sure that you got the right files lined up 
And yeah, that's what we want. Cool. So I want to talk a little bit about this too. Um, I won't cut anything, but I want to show off what the setup looks like and what the file looks like because it can be, um, it's a lot of numbers. I listed out everything. I did the math for you to figure out exactly what depth, what offset. So it's all listed out there in the file. And for that, I'm going to use the shelf. Slide that into place. And first and foremost, when you're setting up this cut, go ahead and put, give yourself an X. So well, let's hop to straight on camera. Mark an edge. That's also going to be your reference edge in your workstation. So when you cut these tenons, you know you're flipping and you're still keeping that edge. So once you have that X, you know that's going to be your bottom. And you come over to this, press it up against there. In this case, I wouldn't want to put that there. I'm going to actually float it out here because I don't want to cut into my ankle fence and zero out the height. For the sake of expediency, I already have a grid set up, so I'm just going to use the existing grid. But I am going to add to my scan. Remove, erase, just so I can see what I'm working with. There we go. All right, bringing in the side panel, side A curve, side B curve is the longer one. There we go. You're gonna use that custom anchor point to drop it actually right here. When you make a new grid off of this material, you're gonna do the back side for one and two, and then the side, not the tenon, but the side right there all right so this is what it looks like gives you a nice text readout so depth is 0.07 and offset 0.1 and you do a pass this currently have a very small bit in there but I'm gonna change that bit really quickly because I have another fun thing to show you all Another one that we're adding to our repertoire. It's a if you bit, thought the last one was cool, yeah. this one is something else. It's a bit of a monster. Um, and a it bit is of a monster? A bit a of monster a monster. of a bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm hearing hissing from, boot, from Goose in my ears for that one. Sorry, Goose. Back to that eight millimeter collet. And we're gonna be using the pocketing bit. That is a 16 millimeter cutter head with three flutes, eight millimeter shank. It solid is solid carbide. It is center cutting, so you can plunge with this. And this is specifically for pocketing. When you want to just speed that process up, whether it is you're doing a large, um, a large inlay or whatever your need be, this is going to speed things up, and it is a joy to use. Now, worth saying. Uh, you know, our general rule of thumb of whatever your bit diameter is should be your depth per pass. But I wouldn't necessarily cruise into doing 16 millimeter deep passes with this thing. Um, but. Yeah, I throw that, I kind of throw that rule out the window past 8 millimeters. Yeah, exactly. Just something to note. You should still treat it with caution, and it is a large bit, so you want to be cautious with it. All right, I just want to put it in there and tell Origin what size it is so you can see what the kerf looks like. 16 millimeters. And again, keep your eye out for these new bits in our store. Link on our website. Um, I'm very excited to have them in there. Okay. Now when I hover over my cut path, you can see how large my kerf is, which is really, really handy. 
So as I come through, I make my cuts, I adjust my depth and my offset per pass, and it will give me this stepped, this gradual step all the way down to a final depth of 0.25. Once I'm at this 0.25 depth, I'm just using offsets to kind of clear out material. And this finish, honestly, with this bit is fantastic. I'm still gonna scrape it, and I still have to take it to the table saw to get rid of this chunk, but I can't necessarily come all the way down here with Origin and get rid of all of this, because then I have nowhere for Origin to ride. So, took away quite a bit of it, and I can put this up on the table saw, up on edge, and slice this off, no problem. Incredible. Cool. That's what do you say we roll into Q&A? I think we're ready. Got anything else? No, I think the only the only thing is this little handle detail, and we did this on Insta um, Instagram Live. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's show off the handle and then give everyone a, a second look at the box, just because the box deserves to be dwelt upon. So, come down here, Goosey. I wanted to take that same language and bring it up to the top, and also I have a 3 8 by 3 8 uh, square rod that also has those grooves cut into it just to give it a little texture for the handle um, and these are just mortised directly into the top lid and then underneath all of this was done, done with origin on shelf and this was especially done with that 16 millimeter cutter I just showed you made stuff like this a breeze okay so for this little detail and being able to reliably and repeatedly cut that. I did a little quick ad hoc feature in my workstation shelf, just using Ontool CAD to cut this. And you've probably seen this before, this style of things. So that fits my material in there perfectly, as long as it's butted up to this edge over here. I've placed my file, so I just do one pass retract, pull it out, rotate it, and continue. Mm -hmm. It's all about making the setup quick and easy and repeatable. Repeatable. And uh, where you might have seen that in the past is Jake's green and green style table, where he made a similar fixture to make all of the screw hole covers. Yeah, all one. those little those Wenge plugs. Dozens, like 40 or 50 little plugs <laughs> on that table. It was a lot. Uh, but a fixture will make it easy. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. It's always a pleasure, and uh, we will see you in two weeks.